Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pray First, the conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. It's so good to be with you all on this day. Today is 11-24-2021. Hashtag live if you're joining live. Hashtag recorded if you're joining recorded. And hashtag shared and get this out on your pages. What's happening, everybody? It's Thanksgiving week. Uh, we've got a lot to be thankful for. We're going to talk about one of those things today. Uh, as we talk about uh, heroes and heroines. Hello, Lolita. Hello, Christine. Hit the hearts and the lights. Go crazy on those and let all of our first-time guests know that you are glad that they are, in fact, here. Good morning, Brandy and Sean. Good morning, Raymond. Good morning, good morning. Make sure you hit those hearts and lights because that lets all of our first-time guests know that we're glad that they are here. Remember, all of us were first-time guests at one time before we came, became part of the Pray First family. Not only can you share out this conversation we're having this morning, you can share out the Pastor Doug page and people will get notifications when we go live and you will not have to share it so much not always got to share it. what's up ricky good morning good morning hi michelle you guys doing well staying warm uh tomorrow is thanksgiving day can you believe that how 2021 is flying it seems like 35 minutes ago it was 2020 everybody was talking about 2020 good morning nita k it's almost 2022 wow good morning chip good morning glory Good morning, Ed. Good morning. It's good to see all of you guys in here this morning. Um, I've been up for several hours. I got a jump start on the day. I think it was 4 o'clock a.m. your time this morning when I was studying AI and the implications that it has on uh, not just some kind of fantasy world, but every one of our worlds. So let me just say this uh, while I'm at it. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, Drodrick. Good morning, guys. Uh, you're going to want to have some sort of education on AI. Uh, for yourselves and your children. Uh, these are the good old days. I posted out this morning uh, the things that they are doing now and that we are doing with social media and the digital, uh, electronic, and technological world that we live in. Uh, it's going to be archaic compared to how our lives are going to be emphatically and drastically different uh, as we live in an AI world. It's going to be the, it's way bigger than the internet, uh, very much bigger than. Uh, laptops, cell phones, 5G, all of those things are being structured up for that. Let's talk about heroes, though. I just want to drop that out there and say good morning and, and uh, get that on your mind just a little bit. One of the things that you do around the Thanksgiving holiday times is you start listing things that you are thankful for. This past weekend at Crosspoint, in uh, the series we've titled In the Meantime, what are we going to do while we wait for something to change? Or what are we going to do while we wait for something to happen? Or God to answer a prayer? We're going to make ourselves ready for what God has ready for us. We talked about forgiveness. I am so thankful to be forgiven. My response to that thankfulness that I have been forgiven is that I'm going to extend that, forgive, that forgiveness towards others. Let me just give you a definition of forgiveness. Everybody hashtag forgiveness. Rebecca, I see that your surgery, uh, let me go back up here, is planned for Monday. Rebecca McElnelly. Uh, so let's be praying for her. Uh, let me give you this definition for uh, forgiveness because this is vitally important as we talk about uh, the heroine, an ordinary person who did an extraordinary thing. And you are uh, the hero that, that this world needs, and it's going to be based on forgiveness. The definition of forgiveness, to release, to release someone. Remember this weekend I said if you're going to walk in your destiny, if your character is ever going to support your destiny, you're going to have to release people. But to release people, you're going to have to receive. If you're going to release people in forgiveness, you're going to have to receive forgiveness. Because if you feel like in any way that you are having to pay for, or if you're having to uh, make up for uh, your sin, you're going to make other people pay for and make up their sin to you. It's to release. It's to receive. And it's to believe that you have actually been forgiven. To release or absolve fully from penalty and also to lift up to bear. Set or declare free from blame, guilt, or responsibility. First Corinthians, let's just go ahead and jump in the Word because I have quite a few uh, verses this morning that I want to read to you. As we've been talking about heroes, we've talked a lot about Old Testament heroes, and you know my feeling about that. Uh, I respect the Old Testament uh, men and women of faith. 
I do not, however, worship them. I do not worship Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I do not worship Noah. I do not worship David. I do not uh, uh, worship these, quote, heroes of the faith. Uh, I'm not so much into looking at them in stained glass. I think it's wonderful what they did during their time. It also serves an as an example for us in our time, but they're not here. Those saints are not here. They lived during their time, during their generation, and God used and worked through them mightily to affect what was going on in the world in their time. That leads us to our time in 2021, 2022. Uh, David's not here. Noah's not here. Moses is not here. Abraham is not here. Isaac is not here. Jacob is not here. Uh, Rahab is not here. Ruth is not here. You are. You and I are. So when we make these people seem like they're magical characters of a kingdom far, far away, and we uh, deitize them and put them in stained glass, and we put them on our necklaces as if they're with us, uh, they're not here. But we are, and God has something to do in and through us. So let's look at what does he want us to use their examples for? Why does God want us to use the examples of the men and women of faith in the Old Testament? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. I don't want you to be ignorant of their history. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Listen to this. And that rock was Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now these things occurred. Now here's why we look back on the examples of the men and women of faith in the Old Testament. Verse 6. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things just as they did. These things these things are written, these things are chronicled, these things are documented that occurred as examples. Everybody hashtag examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idol worshipers as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Diabolos. I can't even go into all this right now. And do not grumble. Do you notice that this passage puts grumbling in the same category as sexual immorality? That this passage puts grumbling in the same category with idol worship? And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Verse 11. These things happened to them, and it's repeated emphatically. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings. Everybody hashtag warnings. It seems so often that many of the messages I bring uh, from God are warnings. They're warnings. They're encouragements of what to do, what not to do, how to see, how not to see, perspective and not to have certain perspectives. These things happen as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination, listen to this, they're warnings to us, upon whom, us, the culmination of the ages has come. The culmination of all the things that's happened has now come. We're going to talk about a heroine this morning, and we're going to talk about what qualified her. That heroine's name is Rahab, and many of you have heard of her as Rahab the harlot. Um, I guess she's never going to lose that title, though much of her life she was a, uh, a faith-filled person who was not a harlot. Uh, when you get to heaven, you probably shouldn't walk up and say, oh, you're the hoe from Jericho because her life was changed. It became drastically different. She received forgiveness. She was fully absolved. She was completely released from blame and responsibility. 
She was forgiven, changed, made whole. Uh, some of you are still living in the identity that you had before Christ. Uh, the identity that you had before Christ is in no way a hero. It's a zero, uh, but you're not that person anymore, and you're becoming a new person. The person that you are is not the person who you were, and the person that you were and the person that you are is not the person that you'll become. So Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, let's really look at uh, Rahab's, Rahab's life and see what she brings to the table as far as a hero is concerned. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly. Okay, so remember Moses sent out 12 to spy out the promised land. Ten of them came back with a negative report. Only two of them came back with a positive report. Ten of them said, we can't do what God's called us to do. Two of them said, we absolutely can. I think Joshua learned from the mistake of big committees. <laughs> in, the, in the presence of big committees is the opportunity for big indecision. Joshua said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to send some faith-filled men over. I'm only going to send two. Um, and I'm going to see what they say about the promised land. So he sends these two men out from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, go and view the land, the promised land, and especially the city of Jericho. So they went and came to the house of the harlot. Everybody hashtag harlot. Uh, let's not clean that word up. Uh, a harlot is a prostitute, someone who sells their soul in an inhumane way, making themselves uh, feel like they are less than, broken more, uh, and unfit to. I'm going to say that again. Selling their soul, making them feel like they are less than, and that they're unfit to. This is a harlot. Let me, let, me, let me make sure you understand in biblical terms, she was a prostitute. She sold her soul. She wasn't just a prostitute. She wasn't just a harlot. She was a whore. <laughs> you say, I can't believe, yeah, yeah, you can. She wasn't just a whore. She was a hoe. Just so make sure that all the generations that are listening to Pray First understand, this person was very broken this person felt very inhumane. This person's soul was shattered. This person was very, let's just, I'm just going to say the word, lived in a very nasty way. Um, but this is where the two spies end up in the house of the harlot Rahab. And they lodge there. So what could a prostitute, whore, hoe, what can, what, what can a person of that pedigree bring to heroism? What could they possibly bring to the table? Well, I'm going to tell you three things, but I'm only going to tell you two today. Here's three points about Rahab, but we're going to just do two today. So number one is this. Rahab brought sin to the table. What qualified her as a hero? What, what qualified this, this person, this ordinary person, to do extraordinary things? What was one thing she brought to the table? She brought sin to the table. This, should, this shouldn't discourage you. This should encourage you. It should encourage you and I that she brought sin to the table as a hero, because that's exactly what you and I bring to the table when we begin our journey with Jesus Christ. It's, it's exactly the same thing. She didn't bring anything different to the table than you and I have. What, what qualification do you and I as ordinary people have to do extraordinary things and thus be an ordinary hero? We're bringing sin to the table. We're bringing our filth to the table, our dirtiness, our brokenness, which is, in fact, Nothing more and nothing less than separation from God. Rahab was the lowest of the low. Do you understand me? She wasn't just the lowest of the low. She was the lowest of the low in a low place. Jericho was a low place. 
Jericho's standard of morality was very, very low. And in, an, in a society where the standard of morality was so low, Rahab's was the lowest. She had been described as the lowest of the low. She was a prostitute. She was a harlot. Listen, Jericho was going to be judged with or without Rahab. God had already designed, ascribed, and declared judgment on the city of Jericho. It wasn't just her. It wasn't just Rahab. It was the lowest of the low. Morality, ethics, sin, distance from God had gotten so incredibly bad that the city was full of disease. I want you to understand, the further you get away from God, the, the, the further distance between you and God, the less your soul, your spirit, and your body can exist, the disease of culture had come on them. And I'm not talking about spiritual. I'm talking about physical diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. I want you to understand that God was judging Jericho for the diseases and the filth, not, not that was genetic, but that had come upon them because of their sin and the way that they lived. And their distance, that sin that had, des uh, that had uh, distanced them from God. Don't you think a society that was being judged for sin, that was dying in filth and disease and darkness and separation from God, don't you think that the prostitute in that society probably had the diseases of that society? Now, let me, let me say that one more time. Don't you think that the prostitute in that society had the diseases of that society? And God takes this, this woman, Rahab, the lowest of the low, who had the diseases of the society around her and includes her in his plan. Are, are y'all are y'all hearing? Are you hearing anything? Are are you listening? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. I bring the same thing to the table of heroism that Rahab brought. I bring sin. I started my journey in complete sin, complete filth, and complete separation from God. That's what I brought to the table. God, you're going to use Doug. How are you going to use Doug? Well, he's full of sin disease, guilt, shame, condemnation. He has nothing to bring to the table that relates to heroism except for sin. And yet, God says, I'm including Rahab. What does that mean to you, Larry? What does that mean to you, Michelle, Brandy, Becky, Tasha, Patty, Raymond? What, what, does, that, what does that mean to you, Audra? What does that mean to you, Derodrick? What does that mean to me, Doug? What does that mean to to you, Philip, what does that mean to Patty? What does that mean to all of us? You're included. You're included in the plan that God has for the world. Do you realize the opportunity we have in front of us because the world is diseased, broken, and immoral, far from God, and separated by sin? You and I have an opportunity to be included in the story in the lives, in the eternal plan of God for the universe as much as or more than every other stained glass window living disciple who's ever graced the aisles of a Southern Baptist church on a backcountry road singing, bringing in the sheaves. You are as much a part of that plan as any of them were. As a matter of fact, we are here at the culmination of the ages according to Scripture the culmination of everything they built upon, everything they laid foundations of, every life and every day they lived and every success and every failure that was written as examples to us is to empower us for the culmination of the ages. That excites me. Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse 2 through 11. We'll see how far we get today. 
The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out our land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab the harlot. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out our whole land. But the woman had taken the two men, and she had hidden them. Yes, the men came to me, she said, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly, king. You might catch up with them. But she had taken them to the roof and hidden them under stalks of flax. She had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gates were shut behind them. Verse 8. Before the spies laid down that night, she went up to the roof, and Rahab the harlot said to these two men who were spying out the promised land, I know the Lord has given you this land, and that great fear of you has fallen on us all, so that every one of us who live in this country, we're melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord, we have heard, everybody hashtag heard, we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard, everybody hashtag heard, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God, Listen to this statement by this outsider, by this sinner, by this prostitute, by this lowest of the low. Listen to her statement. For the Lord your God is the God in heaven above and over all the earth. What did she bring to the table? What did Rahab bring to the table of heroism? Number one, sin. Number two, Rahab brought faith. This is so important. Don't miss this. What did Rahab the prostitute bring to the table of heroism? Number one, sin. Number two, faith. This woman, this idol-worshiping pagan, had more faith in a God that she had only heard about than the children of Israel who had seen God deliver them. <laughs> this woman, this pagan woman, this prostitute pagan hoe from Jericho had more faith in the God that she had simply heard about than the men and women of Israel who saw God deliver them through the plagues, who saw God part the Red Sea, who saw God bring water from a rock, who saw God rain down manna from heaven, who saw God use birds to bring them meat, this woman who never laid eyes on deliverance but had merely heard about deliverance had more faith than all of them combined. That's powerful. This is what I want you to get out of that. Where there is faith, sin can be dealt with. <laughs> Come on, that is exciting, that's encouraging. I want to encourage you, where there is faith, sin can be dealt with. What did this woman from Jericho bring to the table of heroism, this prostitute, this pagan? She brought sin. But what else did she bring? She brought faith. And where there is faith, sin can be dealt with. Her faith was not in her works. Let's read this verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 and 31. By faith... The walls of Jericho fell. This is in the New Testament. The army marched around for them for seven days. Verse 31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Let me tell you something. Rahab did something, but that's not why she's a hero. Her hiding the spies did not make her a hero. Her belief that their God was the real living God, the only God, the God above the heaven and earth, that faith caused her to do something. I'm telling you something right now. You need to understand this. Uh, the one thing that qualified Rahab to be a hero was her faith. The one thing that qualifies you to be a hero will be your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. She did works. She did and applied action 
because of her faith. Are you listening to me? Faith comes first. When you have faith, you will act. When you have faith, you will do. When you have faith, you will work. She didn't have faith because of her works. Listen, if you lack works, if you lack action, it's because you lack faith. And I want you to understand, what our world needs today is heroes. What kind of heroes, Pastor? Ordinary heroes. Men and women like you, who don't bring great wealth, great education, great knowledge, great anointing, great um, understanding maybe of biblical things or uh, what, what God wants. It's for you to bring your sin. And lay it off on Christ. What God wants is for you to have faith. Because when you have faith, sin can be dealt with. What does a disciple look like? John chapter 6, verse 28, and then I want to close. What does a disciple look like? The disciples asked Jesus this question, what do disciples do? How do they act? When they have faith, what do they do? Listen to this. The disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to do the work that God requires? I want to say that again. The disciples are asking Jesus, what must we do? What must we do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Why? Why? Because when faith is present, sin can be dealt with. When faith is present, action follows. When faith is present, ordinary people do extraordinary things and rescue those who are lost, afraid, and in the dark. Every one of you listening to my voice right now has this potential. Give yourself to the Lord. Give yourself to God. He wants to do something through you. Not someday, but today. In your family. Entering this holiday weekend. Uh, from my family. Pastor Doug, Brandy, Paxton, Cooper Jarvis, and here at the Cooper home in beautiful Kingsport, Tennessee, I want to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. And if there's something that we can all as followers of Christ be grateful for, thankful for, is that the Holy Spirit reached out to us and that by faith, we embraced him. And by faith, we've been made righteous. And by faith, our sin's been dealt with. Father, bless every one of these families, every one of these men, every one of these women, every one of these guys who are dealing with different stages and different places in their lives or who some of them still feel like they're identified with who they used to be. They're not who they used to be. Father, for those of them who are far from you and do not know you, I pray that they would reach out and call on your name right now and be saved. In the name of Jesus. You don't have to understand it. It's by faith. Lord, bless every single one of them and no spirit but your Holy Spirit have your way in our lives, in our families, and in our homes. As the family dynamic can get tricky sometimes, as the family dynamics can be complicated sometimes, God, You've created us to do hard things. Love never fails. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I will see you tomorrow briefly uh, just to kind of wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving and pray over uh, our lives uh, for the upcoming year. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, I'm on vacation. <laughs> I'm going to drink some more coffee. I want to go to Walmart and play. Yes, Walmart. Don't ask why. It's just a thing around here. Uh, I am safe. Um, the Tennessee people have been throwing mustard. Uh, I almost got hit by a golf ball. But I am safe. The Lord is with me. And uh, hotty toddy. Bye, everybody. <laughs>